Hello and welcome to the new season of Girl Boss Radio. Ooh. My name's Puno. I'm the founder of I Love Creatives. It's a website, but it's also a place for creative slashies to stack their digital skills alongside a good vibes community. And I'm also the new host of Girl Boss Radio. Hey, I know, I know. You're probably thinking, wait a minute, where's Sophia? Well, we'll be unpacking that and a whole lot more in this episode where Sophia will be passing the torch to a new girl boss. That's me. Hi. So 2021 is starting off a little better. (laughs) We have our first female vice president. Yes. Woo. But there's still a lot more work to do. You know what I'm saying? Girl Boss Radio has interviewed really impressive people and we support their success. But in a way, we've kind of just scratched the surface. And the past stories you've heard on this podcast are just one small part of a bigger picture. A picture we believe includes untold stories from women defining success in their own way. And that's our mission. We want to share the voices of people who are challenging success. They're changing it. They're expanding it. And quite frankly, just trying to figure out what success means specifically for them. And then being okay with that. For me personally, success is about putting my happiness first. But you know what? That definition might be different to someone else at a specific time or phase in their life or just different. And that's the point. So stay tuned to the end of the episode to hear about where we're going to be taking this podcast this season and more importantly, why this change. Let's get it going. Roll tape. Should we do the the toast? Cute bottle. It's cute, right? Uh It's champagne. Okay. It's going to explode. No, didn't explode. You're talented. You have more talent. Are you going to drink it out of the bottle? Cheers. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Dude, is it weird that I'm um, interviewing you on Girl Boss? Not really. I, I might just start interviewing oh. you. <laughs> you just can't help yourself? Yeah, right. We're going to just get into the hard hitting questions then. Okay. So I don't think that a lot of people realize that you're not at Girl Boss. No. I'm like, should I have stayed or something? I guess I could yeah. have. I don't know what I'd be doing. I'm Sophia. So the question is, is it weird? Um, Not really, because I'm like doing my thing, you know? I don't really look back, maybe enough. It wasn't fun to hand the keys to Girl Boss over in terms of who's operating it. I loved the team that I built at Girl Boss, but I'm also just happy to pass the torch. I don't, I'm not really like attached to anything, which is weird, but I'm happy for you. I texted you and was like, you should host this. You should be the host. (laughs) I'm so glad it worked out and they didn't put someone else behind the microphone because that would be weird. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome to Girl Boss Radio, Puno. Thank you. Thank you. A lot has happened since 2017. You actually sold the company to Attention Capital, which is a holding company. And it was about two years after you founded Girl Boss. The first thing that I'm wondering is why did you sell it? And then did you make did you make some money from that or Well that's confidential. Okay, all right. But did I why did I sell it? You know, I sold it to someone that I absolutely adore who's one of our investors at Girl Boss, a good friend of mine someone who was building something like pretty awesome and i sold it because i was like i just didn't want to keep raising money didn't want to raise venture capital and wanted to partner with a long-term kind of financial partner who was going to build the company with us i don't actually even really know what a holding company Uh, is how is that different from a vc company yeah so venture capitalists are kind of hands-off They invest in companies and they invest in really high risk companies, very speculative and who knows if it's going to become the next Instagram. They're not the kind of investors that are, ooh, if we double our money, we'll be happy. They want you to build the company 
to 100 times the size it is when they invest. And so they own a chunk of your company. Usually they want 20%, which means you still control most of your business. And then a holding company, they're an acquirer. They would buy a company like Girlboss and they would buy it from you know, everyone who has stock in it, which would be the founder, the employees, the investors, the existing venture investors, shareholders, and it would be planted within this company that holds multiple businesses. For example, it's like Urban Outfitters owns Anthropology and Free People and Urban Outfitters. So that's, I guess that's what a holding company is. You were saying that you didn't want to raise capital anymore. How did VC funding for you affect your decisions as a founder? Yeah, I think a lot, you know, because when you don't have investors, you can kind of do whatever you want. When you do have investors, you have a board and they're like, we trust you. We didn't have a board that was telling us what to do. But we ended up building a social network, but that's expensive. It takes a lot of engineers. And we did that because venture wants technology. They don't necessarily want an events business. There's no like events business that's venture back. So there are certain types of business models that investors see as something that could like explode. And technology businesses, social platform forms are one of them, but they're also really hard to build. And I don't know if I would have built that had that not be the thing that I felt like investors wanted. So with Girlboss, we were doing a lot of things and you guys are doing less things now, which is smart. So we were doing events, we were doing, you know, we had conference, we had retreats, we had brand partnerships that lived across website content, a newsletter, a podcast, we built a social network, but you really don't want to fracture your your time and your focus like that. Today, I'm building what I want. Like I don't have investors. I'm teaching entrepreneurs. I'm not doing too many things. I really, I really understand the power of focus, which is actually so much easier. So it's cool to have finally gotten there as kind of like an ADD. All my ideas are good. I want to pursue all my ideas and now just be like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to do things one at a time. I'm the person who's, I'm a slashy, I'm a slashy, but I do like to focus and actually work on a big project, but that was real recent. Yeah, (laughs) it takes a while to get there. Maybe it's like a mid thirties thing. I don't know. (laughs) Do you do the time blocking thing? Oh yeah. I'm all like, okay, this is my time for Isle of Creatives. This is my time to cut Mwadib's hair. The, The cool thing though about taking VC money, and and obviously that's the part that everybody likes about it, um, is that you are able to hire a lot of really amazing, talented people Mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. You had an office, you had a marketing budget, and, and I feel like that's also why you guys grew so fast and were able to like produce events that were super high quality, um, so I guess like that's the hard part about it, right? Because those are the trade-offs of taking VC funding and not taking it. So for you, besides the focus thing, like are there other deal breakers that have changed for you? Yeah, like I only want to run a profitable business. That's all. I really want to bootstrap. I don't want investors. I want to be in control of my future. I don't want to answer to like many masters. You know, I'm teaching entrepreneurs how to bootstrap with business class, which is my online course. I really want to connect with my community and help them and teach them and give them lots of value. But I don't really want that to rely on, you know, how people who may or may not understand how my business works feel about the business, right? I know my community, my customer, and I know what they want. So I'm like very, very clear on how I want to work, how much I want to take on or not. Really, hopefully less is more. So far it has been. You know, revenue's great. Like the launch of business class was amazing. We did over seven figures. But at the same time, I'm not in it for just growth. I'm in it for a quality of life. I'm in it to build the right thing, long-term value, something that I love doing. And yes, profitable, but not profitability over growth. Yes, because growth makes you make other decisions. I feel like sometimes when I think about growth, even as a lifestyle business, they are rushed and they're not with really good intentions. 
Totally, yeah. You don't want your intention to be money. Like, it's nice, and you should be listening to your audience and what it is that they want often translates into revenue. But for that to be your motivation, often you end up building the wrong thing. Um, And at the beginning of 2020, we had a $10 million partnership on the table signed by us and waiting for counter signature from this massive company. The attorneys had blessed it. It was done the day they were supposed to sign it, COVID hit. And it just decimated our revenue, you know, and also COVID. Like, we can't do it. We couldn't do events, which is like a mm-hmm. huge part of the girl boss business. That's part of why I left. It was yeah. like we, you know, we shrank. The business opportunity wasn't as big. We didn't see, we couldn't see when that was going to change. You know, I worked for free for several months. We had to lay off the majority of the team. And then it's like, do I want to rebuild my business again? What am I really working for, like we're not hiring. I like to keep moving. And so I'm not precious about what I'm attached to. I never intended to be the girl boss. And so part of me is just like, I, you know what? I wanna move on. I had an employment agreement. There wasn't really much employment happening anymore. And I was like, okay, on to the next thing. I'll always be the girl boss, but doesn't mean I have to be working at girl boss. Mm-hmm. You know, Nasty Gal gave women confidence through getting dressed, right? It was more than fashion. Girl Boss inspired women, and it was really across all parts of their life. It was career, it was generally being entrepreneurial, it was about confidence, it was very kind of broad. And with business mm-hmm. class, what I'm doing is this is for entrepreneurs, this is what I'm qualified to teach. I could talk to career women about confidence and you know, negotiating, you know, their salaries, but I've never been in that position. I mean, I might have asked for like a dollar more an hour at a shoe store or something at some point. Um, But what I am qualified to talk about is the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. And so it's really been a natural progression into business class. Um, Mm -hmm. Girl Boss wasn't necessarily about bootstrapping because the business, uh, it was venture backed. When we weren't necessarily teaching people how to bootstrap, I wasn't evangelizing it per se. And now I'm really focused on doing that myself, which is where I started. I built Nasty Gal from the back of my Volvo to $28 million in revenue annually, profitably with no debt and no investors. And I mean, you don't even need to have a $28 million business to bootstrap and have a good life, right? You can make $100,000 bootstrapping and you aren't beholden to anybody else. You know, you are in control of your future. You have financial freedom. I think people look at people who are have really accomplished a lot and are on like the Forbes 30 under 30 and all these entrepreneur lists. And that's not really what matters. And having a a life that you love and control is often better than having an unwieldy kind of bigger business, which ends up not being that fun because I've been there. And I know a lot of founders who are like, great, I'm successful, but shit, like this sucks. For me, it all came down to control. And, but with control came the consequences of my own decisions that could be shitty and not good and but I I really like that I just like iterating I like seeing my mistakes and then being able to make the call on what we what we can experiment with next I don't think people value that control as much they're so they're so willing to give it up for just more money and I'm just like I don't know man (laughs) but you don't get to make your own world yeah it's easy to chase yeah it's easy to be like whoa this money or opportunity and then you find yourself in a place where you're like I don't like what I do when I wake up in the morning but I have a nice handbag and it's just like nobody cares about that stuff anymore Mm -hmm. it's just I think our priorities have all been reset in the last year um, and what's really valuable seems to have kind of emerged for people in a way that was a lot harder to find and a more material world um, prior to COVID. So the issue though with bootstrapping is that you don't have funds and you don't have the resources. But what's crazy to me is that COVID, it was already 2020, so that's already stressful enough. Mm -hmm. But then you still 
built out business class in just like a few months. Yeah. And I was like, what? I literally blinked and it was up. <laughs> How do you approach getting new projects off the ground specifically during COVID? Yeah, I mean, I've loved working remotely. I've done my best mm -hmm. work behind a computer by myself, like Nasty Gal I did for behind a computer and then eventually had employees, but I'm just like able to focus and create and you know, with teams, like I love leading teams. I love uh, the creative that other, you know, people bring to the table and the things you're able to accomplish with teams, but really starting a brand, really like building out business class to have my hands in like everything is just like so much fun. The flight manual, the flight puns are endlessly entertaining. <laughs> and, you know, the idea of bringing a kind of like new spin on entrepreneurial education was just like, whoa, this is this space is just like wide open. Uh, I can make like a really beautiful brand and really great content. I did work with a creative agency on the branding, but I named it and, you know, put together the mood boards with all the like Pan Am references and et cetera, et cetera. But everything else was done. You know, we shot it at my house. We set up a studio in the house. It looks super slick. Like, you know, it was all, I mean, I wish I could show you this desk. It's, it's pretty much as wide as this frame that we have here. And I just did it all from here. I think people think that because I've been building businesses for 15 years that I'm like not in the weeds anymore, but that's the most fun part. And I think people are like, when I'm successful, I'll have a team. And if you tell people you have a hundred employees, which I've had, they're like, wow. And it's like, no, not wow. Actually, I want to be doing this stuff, but now I'm in meetings about timelines and warehouse management and technology, like implementations and HR policies. That's what happens when your business explodes. And that's awesome. Not complaining, kind of. Mm -hmm. But I, I just really love the stage of the business where I get to move quickly and I can accomplish a lot alone or with just a few people which is just like way more fun for me. So I was able to just go, all right, I get to make a new brand. I love making brands. You get to work with creatives all the time. You get to see their new branding, creating brands. I was like, fuck yeah, I get to create another brand. So stoked and it may be the best brand I've ever cre created. I really love it. I really, really love it. When I took the course, I was just like, dang, I feel like you had a lot of very specific pillars that like the binder to me like the binder is very key and the sounds that you have in the course that's legit bing bong <laughs> yeah obviously the co the content is great but those little things for me just make me excited as a student i think it was re really really well done and i as someone who's always had this like uh, i don't know if i want to be an online course creator because it's kind of cringy and um, and seeing, it really can you know, be. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. It's like, it, oh my gosh, the world, <laughs> this whole world is just like, what? This is so archaic, but you know what? Like it's a good business and you have so much to teach and I have so much to teach and what a privilege it is to pass it along rather than just keep doing it ourselves, which, you know, we still are, but to harvest that knowledge for a new generation of entrepreneurs is just like that's such an incredible privilege and something you know we're so lucky to do every day all right clinky time for our favorite break wine break and speaking of wine are you sick and tired of your drink going stale bah yuck no meh I know, it's just in the fridge, just sitting there. Don't you worry, Usual Wines is here to solve that problem. Their bottles are really cute. It's one of those bottles that everybody will go, oh my God, that bottle's really cute. Cute bottle. It's cute, right? Uh -huh. It's champagne. And each bottle is a single serving, which means Usual is fresh every time. That means no more pouring wine down the sink when you can't finish that bottle. So you're gonna say bye-bye to flat, bubbly, or stale rosé. Bye, I don't like it. Give me the sparkles. I demand the sparkles. You got it, no problemo. 
Use the discount code GIRLBOSS to get your first glass on us. Peruse on over to usualwines.com. That's U-S-U-A-L-W-I-N-E-S.com. Or, you know, just check out the link in our show notes. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. Does your 2021 goal include growing your business? If part of your plan is adding new members to your team, then LinkedIn Jobs, it's got your back. LinkedIn Jobs finds the right person pretty darn fast. You just start by posting a job with targeted screening questions, and then you can manage your job post and contact candidates through a single streamlined screen. So why don't you let LinkedIn Jobs handle the people part for you, and then you can focus on running your business. And when you're ready to make that next hire, mm -hmm, you can find the right person with LinkedIn Jobs. And right now, actually, you can post a job for free. Mm -hmm, that's right. Just visit linkedin.com slash girlboss. One more time. That's linkedin.com slash girlboss to post a job for free. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Redo. Oh, I got to say this. I love Redo. Uh-huh, that's true. Their Borage Ginseng Active Serum is on heavy rotation. It is on my face right now. And it smells so good. It does. Also, FYI, the founder is a Jamaican Filipina babe. They're a small business started back in 2019. Everything is handmade, vegan, cruelty-free, and they do extensive research with every single ingredient they put in their products. But what I really love about Redo is their scents. They take two to three months to curate scent profiles by blending multiple variations for quality, clarity, and more importantly, proper expression of sentiment. When you put it on your face, you're just like, ah. Support this female founder. Use the code GIRLBOSS at checkout for 10% off your first purchase at redo.nyc. That's R-E-D-O-U-X dot N-Y-C. Or follow at redo NYC on Instagram. And say hi to Asia. Hey! I didn't realize, too, that... I was super fulfilled by teaching. I get really excited about the tangible results. That's what I want. I want people to have financial freedom. I want their businesses to make money. Learning how to is important, but to see that really materialize, that's what's really awesome, is seeing people like mm -hmm. do it. Also not doing the things that I did too, which is I feel like a lot of people really value all the mistakes uh, stories that I have. Watching business class, I thought it was really interesting that you referenced company culture. That's like a big thing that's always on people's minds is about what happened at Nasty Gal. And as an employer, I liked how you broke down what led to employees feeling like there wasn't good leadership anymore. Mm -hmm. But I was curious if for you choosing to talk about that, like that's got to be pretty ah, too <laughs> it's not it's not because it's learnings things may be painful in the moment there was so much written about me and the culture and there's a lot of speculation and things that are embellished but at the end of the day if your employees even if they're on glass door if they're going there it's because they're not feeling heard People aren't bored and we're just writing negative stuff. They don't have an, a, an outlet, so they go to places like that. And it's through that that I was really able to learn, whoa, I had no idea what company culture was because I have never worked in an office. And of course, it's my responsibility to educate myself on how to you know, be a great leader and scale a great executive team and create a you know, nurturing environment where people can grow and have transparency and all of these things that contribute to a healthy culture. But at the same time, I was kind of flying blind. And so unfortunately, that education came at the expense of some people being like, hey, you could do better here. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. I guess, you know, I don't expect to get it right the first time. I was able to 
take everything I learned at Nasty Gal and apply what worked and just as much apply what didn't work to girl boss and to the culture and to the leadership we can learn from our past and it's kind of validating to take what it is that you've learned even if you learned it the hard way and implement it and see wow i am capable of doing this right i'm not doomed i can learn and i can actually implement what it is that i've learned and see and feel the results you see it on people's faces see it in the business results and that's really you know with girl boss that's what I wanted to do. I didn't have a chip on my shoulder to prove anything to anyone else. I had a chip on my shoulder to prove to myself that I could do things better. When you texted me, would you host Girl Boss? The first thing I wrote back was, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> but I'm also thinking, to be very frank, I was thinking, is Girl Boss even relevant anymore? And I, I'm curious for you, like, do you think that Girl Boss is relevant anymore? I think the term has just been used so broadly. Yes, it's descriptive, but the intent was it to be like female boss. It was like, be the boss of your own life, right? Cool. I wrote a book for women because that's who shop for, for me and I'm a woman, so I'll just call it girl boss. And, you know, it, it evolved into 20 million hashtags of girl boss and then a Netflix series that's one depiction of who I am and what a girl boss is and then there's all these people using the word girl boss and I'm a girl boss and the best thing you could ever wish for is that your brand kind of becomes part of the zeitgeist but at the same time you don't have control over it and whatever anybody does with it somehow is a reflection of you and that's a really that's like a mind fuck you know it was an intellectual property game of whack-a-mole. Kristen Cavallari has a girl boss necklace and we're like, no, you can't trademark that. And then someone else is trying to trademark a girl boss other thing and we're like, no, you can't. It was just like, that's expensive. And then you go on Etsy and t-shirt sites and all this random, these random places where people are making like bootleg girl boss merchandise. And it's like, wait, it takes brand equity away from us. And then the I'm a girl boss thing kind of became synonymous with white feminism. I wrote Girl Boss in 2014. It was a very different time. I very naively lived in that bubble and because, you know, I'm white and have a different experience as a woman because I've only worked for myself, I somehow became responsible um, to represent women. And I, I, didn't really co-sign on that. I don't think I'm particularly qualified to do that, but people were like, okay, your turn to speak. And it was just like, whoa, there's been so many expectations of me that I haven't chosen. And again, there's I've put myself in a position of responsibility, but at the same time, that can be really challenging. And so then, especially in the the last year as a lot of female founders have been called out for creating racist cultures or not being inclusive and the whole gamut of things that we've seen, the term girl boss ended up in those headlines, like the demise of the girl boss. Girl boss became kind of wrapped up in the 2020s, um, kind of like changing of the guard of you know white women's voices not being like, okay guys, like we've heard enough of you. Let's make some room for other voices. And to me, that's awesome. I can help amplify those voices. I don't wanna be one anymore. And honestly, there's no room for my voice. I had to go back to remember why I was so like in awe of Girl Boss when you first made it. And it was that representation of women. And it, it felt great we still need that. Like, I know it's 2021, yeah. but we still need Absolutely. that. So, you know, Jacob Tobia, you, you interviewed on Girlboss and they were talking about how they didn't want to be the only non-binary representative. They wanted to be the doorstop that opened the door for everyone and just like, come on, come yeah, on in. Yeah, that's really cool. It doesn't take anything away from me to give what I've built or what I have or what I know to other people. And I mean, I didn't give it, like you've earned it. You belong hosting Girl Boss Radio. But at the same time, there's nothing more gratifying than using the 15 hard years of the rest of my life to be like, 
here, you want an introduction? Great, I still have that relationship. You can totally have an introduction. It's no sweat. That's cool. Well, okay, I'm all about actionable education. And one thing that we're gonna do on the show is we're gonna give girl bosses an opportunity to ask other girl bosses Ooh. for advice. But I'm gonna take this, this spot <laughs> now that you're passing the torch. Do you have any advice Ooh. for? Yeah. In terms of podcasting, you know, what you really want to do is understand the headset of the listener. Because what you want to know, often they want to know, but also in the same way that you want to create a product that people want and not just sell stuff that you think is cool, you want to drive a conversation that you know speaks to the headset of the people whose ears you're in. So. Um, understanding them and empathizing with them and sometimes asking really obvious questions is important because you're not leaving them out and assuming that you know whoever you're talking to might know what ROI is or LTV or CAC or KPIs or all this other shit like acronyms but it's really generous to break that down for the listener and make sure that you're bringing them along with the conversation and not assuming you're not dumbing it down but you're just not assuming that they already know everything that you're talking about. You seem like a great host. And this was something I always struggled with because I have like such a short attention span and I can't listen and think at the same time. But you're, um, you're responding. You're not just like, okay, next question. There's been many times where I was like, uh, okay, next question. Cause I'm just like thinking about the next question. And then someone says something really interesting, but then I don't kind of dig deeper into it necessarily. That's what great hosting is, I think. Um, cool. Thank you so much for not just doing this episode, but for everything. You built a huge audience in the podcast world for women. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks man. for having me. We should do it again. We should do it like once a year or something. Oh, my God. Let's check in. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, I want to thank Sophia for passing the torch and giving me, a small bootstrapped lifestyle business owner, a chance to share my perspective. Back in uh, 2019, I was asked to speak at the Girl Boss Rally about what a lifestyle business is. People were a little confused. They were like, is that a lifestyle brand? Fair. That's fair because it never makes big headlines. The goal of a lifestyle business is to provide a great quality of life to its founders. That doesn't mean that lifestyle businesses are always small in revenue or employees. It, it just means that founders prioritize their values. And when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, yeah, I like that. That sounds good. I am into that. So. If you compare it to a startup, a startup's goal is to grow big enough as fast as possible to provide a return to their investors. The problem is some people look down on lifestyle businesses. They'd say, if you're not seeing 10x growth, you're not a success in business. Someone actually told me that before. And I was like, you know what? If that's your definition of success, that's cool, but that's not how I define success. I'm not gonna lie. It made me question myself. And then I thought, well, wait, 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 wait. Why are other people defining what success is for me? Why should super fast exponential growth be the only defining values of success? There's gotta be other norms. There's gotta be other things available to us. And that's what we're gonna do. We wanna show you so many variations of success that you can't help but feel confident and empowered to define your own. I'm really, really excited to explore that with the people that we're having on the show. So next week, I'm gonna be speaking to Rafi Friedman Gerspan, a trans-Latina human rights advocate. She also worked at the White House under the Obama administration. And then in episode three, I sit down with Nabella Noor, a Bangladeshi American who founded a plus size women's clothing company. We'll even be exploring fibroids and endometriosis with Dr. Soyini Hawkins, a gynecological surgeon. Because you know what? We do not talk about our uteruses enough. 
let's give that uterus some space. But more importantly, we're gonna have fun and we're gonna cry because I'm a crier and we're gonna be transparent and give a whole lot of actionable advice about work, about not having work, about freelancing, working less, business, growth, and of course, how to find your definition of success. Are you pumped right now? I am so pumped right now. Are you guys pumped? I'm talking to myself. I'm in my office talking to myself right now because no one's in here. I've had the pleasure of knowing and watching Sophia and the original Girl Boss team work incredibly hard to grow this community. And while the name Girl Boss has its controversies, we intend to use this podcast, this platform, this company to learn, share, and continue supporting women because we still need it. And I promise myself and the rest of the new Girl Boss team are putting in the work and we're humbly learning along the way. We are open to all feedback and would love all of your ideas, questions, and guest ideas. Let us know on Instagram. And to keep up with Sophia, follow her on her Instagram at Sophia Amoruso. And she's also on TikTok now. We did a little something too. And share your love for Girl Boss Radio by following us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, you know, all the socials. And, um, <clears throat> you know this helps, please be sure to leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, oh, and lastly, have you seen the new daily newsletter, the Girl Boss Daily? It's, it's really good. You should subscribe. Ooh, yes. This episode has been a production of the I Love Creative Studio. Special thanks to our lead producer, Christopher Olin, our assistant producer, Carly Pryor, and our editorial director, Clemence. Episode one could not have happened without our project manager, America Turner, video editor, Olivia Genovese, copywriter, Jen Zhu, designers from I Love Creative Studio, Mindy, Sarah, Bronte, Kelsey, brand partnerships with Nor Agency and Kaylee, marketing geniuses, Taylor and Mel, newsletter extraordinaires, Allie and Cassie, as well as the support from the tiny team in Victoria, Canada. Thanks guys.